from William Butler Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yeah, let me give you those last two lines again. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And some people might say that that is the story of America today and the condition that we're in. And we certainly see the passionate intensity of folks who can't be bothered with the facts. <laughs> but it's not the only story that exists in this country. And so what I'd like to do, Jen, if you would, is um, tell a different kind of story. And I'm going to tell a number of different kinds of stories about some terrific people maybe be inspiring to you, looking at some of our toughest problems and solving them without bothering with the parties at all. And we're going to start with Jennifer Estes, who was 35 years old when she was diagnosed with ALS, the same age as Lou Gehrig when he was diagnosed with that. This is a particularly horrible disease. There's no known treatment. There's no known cure. And what it does is attack the motor neurons. Didn't know you were here for a science lecture, did you? Motor neurons are uh, nerves in the body that tell the extremities what to do, tell everything what to do. And they're quite elegant, actually. If, if this room were a motor neuron, the end of the neuron would be somewhere around Chicago, just to give you a sense of scale in the body. And what happens with ALS is that the ends of the motor neurons die back, like vines withering, and a person loses the use of their fingers and their toes, and then their wrists and ankles, and it climbs up to the extremities until finally they can't eat or swallow or breathe. And the whole time, their brain is functioning fine. So it is one of the toughest way to die. And so she was diagnosed with this, and, um, and she went around looking for, to see what kind of treatments there were and what kind of cures there were. And there was, the answer was, there are none. In fact, if you wanted to do research into curing this, it was a really difficult process. The NIH application would take months to complete. It was 50 pages long. And then you'd have to wait while it was evaluated. And then you'd have to wait for the money. And then you'd build your lab and do your research all the time, competing against every other lab that did that kind of research in the country. And then you'd publish your results, and they'd poke holes in it. It might be five or six years from when you had your idea to when anyone even knew about it and whether it was any good or not. And by the way, the amount of money that was available was negligible. Even though it, had, it affects as many people as cystic fibrosis, the NIH gave it 10% as much money. So everyone who got ALS died. Boom, just like clockwork. It was a death sentence. Okay? So it turned out that there was some promising research that had been done in England that said that stem cells could have a reparative effect. And I'll say more on that in a minute. Um, but of course, stem cells were controversial in this country because they were coming from embryos. And there were people in the Right to Life movement who felt that uh, the potential for these embryos to become human beings outweighed the curative potential that they might have for people who have not only Lou Gehrig's disease, but also Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and uh, also spinal cord damage. In fact, there was quite a controversy on, on President Bush's Council on Medical Ethics. There were resignations, firings, and so on. A lot of debate in the scientific community. And a lot of the top researchers voted with their feet. And there's a lot of great stuff going on in England, Denmark, and Switzerland in terms of stem cells. Um, and uh, even the stem cell lines that were kept here, there were very strict federal limits on how that research could be conducted. So Jennifer Estes, along with her two sisters, founded something called Project ALS. They said, if the government isn't going to get it done, and if the free market really isn't interested until we have a drug that's ready to come to market, then we're going to do it ourselves. Now, Jennifer's occupation, interestingly enough, had been she'd been a publicist in the theater industry. And so she had a lot of famous friends. And uh, so she, what she would do is she'd have a dinner where the hosts were Ben Stiller and Gwyneth Paltrow and Jon Stewart. Now, people would pay 1000 bucks a night in New York City to go to one of these dinners, and they would raise sometimes 800000 sometimes a million dollars in a night, and they would write checks. And they did a couple of interesting things. One is that, that uh, it was an open format uh, application. Write us a letter. And um, it can't be longer than four pages. And then she got the, the, the Estes sisters, because they weren't scientists, got the top research minds in the country to be on an advisory panel. And they sit down, and they look at the four-page application, and they vote. And if they say this gets funded, then they write a check within 10 days. And the only stipulation they have, the only strings that they attach to this money, is that every quarter, 
anyone they give money to has to sit down with everyone else that they give money to and totally tell everything. Everything they're finding, everything that works, everything that's not working, I know, brilliant, huh? Really accelerated it. I went to one of these meetings, and I'll tell you, they might as well have been speaking Greek. I was the only non-PhD in the room, but what was fascinating was to see someone from the Jonas Salk Institute sitting next to somebody from Johns Hopkins, sitting next to somebody from Columbia, sitting next to somebody from Harvard, and they're working on this stuff collaboratively and, um, and making enormous progress. So in addition, Jennifer became, um, she, she said she was somewhere between uh, poster child and spokesmodel. Um, she, she absolutely went, went in front of the media everywhere that she could. This is, um, this is a picture of her testifying um, uh, before a U.S. Senate committee. Um, what you can't quite tell in the lower photo is that little white thing that looks like it's her lapel is actually a breathing tube. After every five or six words, she would have to top, stop and take a sip. Um, so that because she was she was approaching her death, um, so she became an activist in this as well. Here's what they've done so far. The first thing they did is they figured out how to get a piece of your skin and turn it into a stem cell. So they made the whole embryonic debate moot. It's over. Time magazine called it the scientific innovation of the year four years ago. Okay. Um, they also found um, that they could take those stem cells and turn them into motor neurons. So if you had ALS, they could take your skin and turn it into your motor neuron to try tests on. And they now have six different things that they've been able to do with mice that are getting them moving again, mice that were deliberately given ALS. Um, they've made more progress in the last eight years than the previous 192 that this disease was recognized. And they've done it on about $40 million. And they've done it because they wanted to save Jennifer's life. And they were not able to. She died four years ago. But that only strengthened the resolve of the people who have been involved in this. And in the lifetime of most of the people in this room, they're going to cure this disease. They didn't wait for somebody else to do it for them. How were they able to accomplish this? Think of it. They were, they were three total amateurs. None of them had any education in science or research or even this particular illness. Well, the first thing is they lived in a country where they could do what they please. And so if they wanted to do this, they were able to do this. The second thing is that they gathered a lot of people together. Those dinners were not just eating and being around famous people. There was content in there about how important this illness is and how many other illnesses might be reduced if we can make progress with stem cells. They had the idea that they weren't just trying to help Jennifer, they were trying to help the thousands of people who are diagnosed with this illness every year. They believed it would work. And I have to say, they were patriotic. They said things like, in America, we should be able to cure any kind of illness. People shouldn't die this way in a country like ours. They actually had this idea of America as a place that was capable of being superior to its present state, the old, a more perfect union idea. Try to hold on to the ideas in this one for a minute, because we're going to come back to that some. Um, but first, we're going to play a little Q&A. And I'm hoping you'll help me out with answering these questions. Just six numbers that I promise by the time I'm done, you're going to be completely bummed out. <laughs> Who will tell me? How many Americans today without health insurance? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit of a guessing game because a new law took effect yesterday, and we'll see what the results of that are, but, but uh, the, the latest count from the Census Bureau is 49 million. Okay, how about this one? How many Americans are living in poverty, which is $22,000 a year for a family of four? How many, how many people? Oh yes, and people saw this was headlines last week. Good newspaper readers, go ahead. Yeah, it's 44 million. Their average income, by the way, isn't 22,000, it's 13.9. Try to imagine a family of four living on 13.9, and, um, and then 17 million people who are in the next category above, which to me means they're actually in poverty because if it's a family of four living on less than $26,000 a year, they're in poverty, right? Okay, next one. How many Americans' only income is food stamps? Oh dear, she says. Yeah, it's higher than that. <laughs> Go ahead, six million. It's their only income. I know, isn't that something? Let's just, this is, we're talking whole country, so let's just bring it down to one city. Maybe we can sort of grasp the size of it then, okay? So how many people in New York City today, their only food is gonna come from soup kitchens? 10,000 is the guess. Do I have 20? Go ahead. 300,000 people, that's right. Okay, just a couple more. Are we bummed out yet? How many Americans are homeless every year? When I graduated from college in 1982, homelessness was just beginning. I remember seeing a guy on a grate when I was in, I was living in Baltimore and I went to New York City and there was a guy on a grate who was holding a sign saying, I am Reaganomics. I'll never forget it. How many Americans homeless each year? 
3.6. Here's the interesting thing. If you, if you just imagine for a minute, what, if I say homeless person, what comes to mind? You think of a man, he's in his late 50s, early 60s, he's um, a veteran who's got mental illness problems, PTSD, right? He's an alcoholic, he's somebody who's had a drug or criminal history, um, he's somebody who should, once upon a time, would have been cared for in an institutional setting and is cut loose. That's not the face of homelessness anymore. Okay, um, go ahead, that's right. What's happening now more and more is that families um, are faced with paying a medical bill or, um, or paying rent or paying for a car repair that would get them to work or paying rent and so families are ending up homeless even though they've got family members working full time. Don't go ahead yet. What's the guess? Average age of a homeless person in America now. Average. Go ahead. God bless America, huh? Isn't that something? Go ahead. The point of these numbers is that need is no longer a fringe issue in this country. It is woven absolutely through the heart of the center of the fabric of our communities and our lives. We see it and we read about it. And when you put it this way, all it takes is six numbers and you say, oh my goodness. And these things did not start on September 15, 2008 when Lehman Brothers failed. These things have been building and building and building. And it didn't matter if Democrats were in control or Republicans were in control or the economy was up or the economy was down. The steady, steady worsening of these conditions. Thank you. The biggest problem, I think, is not those numbers, but these, which say that we are less connected. And it's part of how these other numbers get so bad. We're less connected in our homes. We're less connected in our neighborhoods. We're less connected in our faith communities. You know, the new Oxford Dictionary, they come out with a word of the year every year. Their word of the year last year was unfriend. <laughs> it's funny, only not funny. We are less connected. Go ahead. So I need, now I'm at the point where I need to tell you another story so we can leaven this a little bit, okay? One of our worst numbers is uh, we now incarcerate more people than any other nation on earth. Um, that one million in probation and furlough uh, and so on is a total guesstimate. I, I'm actually not able to come up with concrete numbers. I've seen everything from 800,000 to five million. But the point is we have a huge, huge penal system here. You go to the websites of the for-profit private uh, penal companies, and they say this is the most recession-proof business there ever was. The largest penal colony in the world is Rikers Island. A budget of $1 billion a year. It holds uh, about 130,000 people through the course of a year, 18,000 at a time. It is so crowded that every time the Staten Island Ferry retires one of its vessels, it's tied up to a pier there and converted to make more beds. Well, so who's in, who's a first time offender in Rikers Island? Typically, it's an 18 year old black male. He's been busted for breaking and entering because he needed money for food or maybe for drugs or maybe for fun. Um, and um, he has had hard times in his life. 100% of the, of the first time offenders have experienced some, some of these um, homelessness, um, deep poverty, hunger, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, lack of access to healthcare, parental incarceration, parental death. Um, and sometimes several of these, sometimes all of these. And they're there for about 180 days or so, getting schooled in the criminal life. And at the end of their 180 days, they're given a sheet of paper. It was pink last time, I know, a pink sheet of paper that was a list of resources available to them upon their release, along with a Metro card that had two fares on it and $20 cash. And not surprisingly, 72% of them are back within 180 days, and they stay on average 10 more years. And this is how you build the criminal mind. So there were two women, just two people, who said, no, I'm gonna try something different because the fact is that these people go out and they commit more crimes and that's a huge cost to the community and our feeling of safety. Um, at the same time, it's a huge cost to these offenders because they just committed one offense and, and now they're gonna have a lifetime experience or you know, they're gonna get out of jail at age 30 and they're gonna have no education and no skills and no resources and they're gonna be a drain on society their whole lives. And by the way, this is all really, really expensive to taxpayers. It's $82,000 a year to house someone at Rikers Island. So that one individual that got the $20 and the, and the subway token is gonna cost $820,000 before we're done times 2.3 million, pretty soon you're talking real money. So what they did was put together something called Friends of Island, and they started by doing a crazy thing. They would sit down with these young men about halfway through their incarceration, and they'd say, where are you going when you get out of here? Where are you gonna sleep? Do you have a high school diploma? Do you need to see a doctor? Have you ever in your life been to a dentist? 
How are you going to eat? And from the answers to those questions, they began connecting these young men with programs that already existed. They weren't inventing stuff. You don't have a place to live, we're going to connect you with housing, with Section 8. You don't have any food, we're going to get you in, in a food stamp program. We're going to connect you with Medicaid so you get some, so some health care and some screening and so on. And, and it eventually, of course, it meant that they were going to have to start educating them. And now it is a school, and that school handles 500 students at a time. It's a long way from the thousands and thousands that go through Rikers Island, but 500 students at a time. And here's the in two interesting things. The first is the reoffense rate drops from 72% to 5. I know, unbelievable, huh? And it's an expensive program. It's 7,500 bucks a kid, except that in the end, it pays for itself pretty well. <laughs> yeah, isn't that incredible? Isn't that terrific? Couldn't we do something like that at virtually every first offender prison in America? How'd they do it? Well, first of all, they could. They said this correction system's not doing a good enough job and we're not gonna wait for government to fix it, we're gonna fix it ourselves. And by the way, we're gonna get some philanthropists to back us and we're gonna get somebody to, to rent us the space for this for a dollar a year. And um, we are gonna not only help these kids but serve the larger purpose of creating our true justice system. Um, and we believe that we can make a difference. And by the way, in this country, we can do this because we have the freedom to do it. We can make a difference because we choose to and we're not gonna wait for right or left to decide it, we're just gonna make a difference. A couple other kinds of people that do this. There are all kinds of people doing these things all over the country. Let me tell you about David Goggins first. He is a former Navy SEAL. And um, he was on a mission in Afghanistan in, in which uh, eight special operations personnel were killed. Uh, it was a helicopter crash. And uh, he decided he wanted to raise money for a scholarship fund for their children, a college scholarship fund. And he decided to do it with the most punishing races imaginable. He started, you know, did the Iron Man, of course, but then he did a double Iron Man. That's a four and a half mile swim, 244 mile bike ride, uh, 52 and a half mile run. He did the Badlands Ultra Marathon, which starts 200 feet below sea level um, in, in, De in uh, Death Valley and finishes 116 miles later at 8,800 feet above sea level at, atop Mount Whitney. That's the one where they test you every six hours to make sure that you aren't uh, being poisoned by kidney shutdown. Um, he did the, the, the Hawaii Ultra Running Team Race, H-U-R-T, in which it was to see how many miles you could run in 48 hours, and he ran 200.5. One guy, 200 miles in 48 hours, okay? Um, compare him to Mark Lewis. Mark Lewis, um, I'm not I think he has a GED rather than a high school diploma, and he um, bags, um, vegetables at the little supermarket in Shelburne, Vermont, where I do my shopping. He's also just become manager of the cash register people. Makes about $18,000 a year. And there's a guy in the meat department um, whose son wanted to compete in the Special Olympics. And so Mark decided he wanted to help raise some money from that. And, and they have a really, really crazy thing um, that they do in Vermont where they will, in the, the, the Groundhog's Day weekend in February, they will cut a, a big square out of the ice in Burlington Harbor and people will get sponsors and they will jump into that freezing water and raise money that way. So here's David Goggins. He has raised $280,000 for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. What a terrific guy, don't you think? And then here is Mark Lewis. And he has raised $125,000 for the Special Olympics. You don't need to be a Navy SEAL to make a huge difference. He's been the largest fundraiser for them now eight years in a row. I want to I wanna high five that guy. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a really divisive issue. Yeah. Good for Mark. Now I'm going to talk about, to give you an idea that I'm not just sugarcoating this, that, 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 this, can be, that this attitude of going beyond the usual way can work on the most tough issues. I'm gonna talk for a minute about abortion. And as soon as I say that word, maybe you feel your blood pressure go up a little bit. All right, that's a genuinely divisive issue. See how your blood pressure is when I'm done talking about this, okay? Go ahead. It has been the centerpiece of political debate for a generation. Every judicial nominee, it's a litmus test. Many of the states have sought ways to reduce or limit access or to be involved in this. Um, this is leaving out parental notification. Uh, some states now that require sonogram and so on, right? This has been the sort of the, the tenor of the political discussion about this, okay? And then there's been the public conversation. In a word, bloody. Does not reflect well on our ability to solve 
the division among Americans. This does not count something like 70,000 threats for all of these things as well, right? This does not show America and democracy at its best. And in fact, even though we've had all this debate and all this ple uh, passion and all this bloodshed, we haven't made any progress. The rate of unintended pregnancy in this country is the same as it was in 1981. We have not moved the needle an inch. And in fact, we continue to be twice as high as the next highest developed nation and well above the global average. So along comes Dr. Michael Carrera, and he says, let's see if we can just put aside the arguing for a minute, and let's look at one segment of the unintended pregnancies in America. About 50% of American pregnancies are unintended. Let's look at teens, because if they have an abortion, it's not a desirable thing, and if they have the baby, it's not a desirable thing. So let's see what we can do to reduce it, and let's do a crazy thing. Let's try things and measure and use data to decide. And he came up with a nine-point program that is now referred to as birth control from the neck up. And yes, there's some education in there, and yes, there's some access to birth control, but primarily it is about attitude development, it's about education, it's about teaching kids about the kind of opportunities they can have if they don't get pregnant, if they don't make a baby, and so on. And, um, and it's gone pretty well. In fact, he's reduced teen pregnancy by 50% in the area that he's been doing these experiments. And he's been able to repeat it over and over enough that now the Children's Aid Society in New York City has adopted it and it is the primary teen pregnancy prevention mechanism there. And there's now a prevention program named for him. And now it's being done in 12 other places around the country, including some of the places with the highest teen birth rates in America. And, um, and we're, there's construction of a national model underway using data and something that just plain works. Now, it's an interesting thing. The Children as Aid Society, we would characterize, if we were to speak broadly, as a liberal group. They're do-gooders of the first order. And, um, and most of their funding comes from the Robin Hood Foundation, a very conservative phil philanthropic group, mostly Wall Street, very conservative guys. They refer to themselves as venture philanthropists. So this guy does so well, they're willing to invest in him. How is it that these two folks can get together? You know, if this thing, if this thing works in enough places, I don't know if it's the 12 that are doing it now, if it's going to take 112, but eventually government will follow. But it's going to take this individual's leadership. So how is it possible? Well, first of all, he could do it. Second of all, he got a bunch of people to help him, including some people he doesn't agree with politically. Third of all, he didn't want to just stop teen pregnancy. He wanted to give these kids an opportunity for a proper adult life and not create a burden on society if children have children. He had an idea that he could make a difference, and he was able to do it. Okay. So, we, I started out with that pretty depressing quote from William Butler Yeats. I feel like I need to give it a bookend now. We're all familiar with this quote from Kennedy's inaugural, right? Ask not what your country can do for you. I, well, I once gave a talk in Massachusetts, and they all started saying it to me. <laughs> Everyone familiar with this, but they're not familiar with what, what the rest of his sentence was, which was, with a good conscience as our only guide, let us go forward to lead the land we love. Um, and I think it's really interesting that he speaks to conscience, um, because we know that our national conscience is not in very good shape. We torture. We invade countries under false pretenses, a fact that doesn't go away even if we do the best we can once we're there. And even as individuals, we say, oh, I'll hit that blood drive next time we walk past the homeless person. And so the idea is if we can join efforts like this, like this, the ones that are going on in your communities uh, at home, that then we can do something about our individual consciences. I'm gonna talk about this a lot in my workshop later if we're able to stop by. But that we can do something about our individual consciences. And if you think about it, if everyone in this room did something for their conscience, how that would lead to a different experience for all of us. And the idea, and the goal is this, that we would come to a feeling of greatness about America again. Who wants to say, you know, today, America is a great nation. That we would return to that feeling of greatness, and what's more important, we'd have a reason to say this is a great nation because of what we were doing and because of what we saw to our national conscience, and then we truly would be able to do what Kennedy called us to do, which is to lead the land we love. I remember a time in my childhood that was emblematic for me in thinking about American greatness. I leave you with an image for that, and thank you so much for your attention. One more.
Thank you. Thanks so much.